and I'm very delighted to have this topic that is liver transplantation for alcoholic hepatitis because uh, this is a topic as has been mentioned that's been controversial for a long time but I'm what generates more interest is the second part of this topic that is being consistent and where to set the bar and that is what I'm going to talk about so to start with with the, some of the basics so as most of the physicians in this meeting would be aware and they are the experts alcoholic hepatitis is a clinical entity with rapid onset of jaundice with elevated serum aspartate transaminase ast levels arising on the background of heavy alcohol use that is the standard definition of alcoholic hepatitis that we all follow and although biopsy has not been considered to be mandatory in most of the recent studies but uh, biopsy reveals steatohepatitis, hepatitis a triad of cholestasis and severe fibrosis and usually it's said that it's in the background of a heavy drinking for more than six months but some definitions prolong this time to as much as five years and abstinence is usually less than two months and jaundice may or may not be accompanied by decompensation in the form of bleeding ascites or hepatic encephalopathy and over the years numerous prognostic scores have been published and used of which the most popular ones are the mdf uh, score the lily score meld score and besides that we have the adic score from spain and then we have the joint effect models so all of them trying to predict the outcomes of these patients that which are likely to survive and those who are not however it's been seen that up to 70 percent of these patients would die within the six months that especially those who have a mdf score of more than 32 and uh, unfortunately most of these deaths that is up to 90 percent of these deaths would occur in the first two months so if we have to act we have to act fast so what is the treatment now for years the medical therapy has been the cornerstone and transplant was always in the background mild cases that is those with an mdf of less than 32 were just treated with supportive care while there was a role for and there is a role for steroids when you have more severely ill patients who are defined with a score of 32 or more than that. However, steroids are not a panacea for this condition and has been uh, shown that over the last 50 years, since the first RCT was published, we have had almost 14 RCTs over the last 50 years, but still we don't know what is the best, who are the patients who would respond best with steroids. And then steroids have very limited benefit. And I've just mentioned this TOPA trial, which is uh, very well published and well read, that though the steroids are beneficial, but if you look at the actual results, the benefit was not reaching statistical significance. And the reduction in mortality was to the tune of only 3% in the steroid versus no steroid group. And actually, there was no benefit in terms of a 30-day or a one-year mortality. So what we are looking at is that it's slight improvement in one month or four week mortality. And the flip side was that steroids were associated with serious infective complications. Uh, that is 13 versus 7%. And this is the very important part for a transplant surgeon because these patients then become untransplantable. And therefore, because of the side effects which have not been highlighted in most of the studies, in actual practice, in one of the surveys, it was found that only 20 to 5 to 40 percent of the providers were actually using steroids. So even if we consider that steroids is the mainstay of therapy, but still, besides abstinence and uh, corticosteroids, there is actually no effective medical therapy for alcoholic hepatitis. So what do we do next? And this was this landmark study by uh, Professor Mathurian and his group, which was published in 2011. It was a small study, only 26 patients. Uh, we selected two patients presented with severe alcoholic hepatitis, but the results were startling. Early liver transplant was associated survival advantage at six months, that is 77% versus 20 continued uh, for during the next two years of study. But the interest that study was considered not only that was being transplanted. And this highlights the taboo with which these patients of severe alcoholic hepatitis have been treated, not only by the general population, but actually by the providers, the physicians and the surgeons. And uh, 
it's been of, often repeated that alcoholism is a uh, self-inflicted disease. So why to go ahead and do a transplant, waste an organ, whether it's in the DDLT setting or the LDLT settings. These are the arguments that have been repeatedly mentioned to prevent these patients from getting transplanted. And it was not only because of these patients being very sick and falling into the ACLF group, ACLF3, and the results of ACLF3 in general, we are, we all know, are inferior to transplant for lesser sick patients with lesser sickness. So com combining both these factors, that is sickness of the patient and the etiology of the disease, these patients were not actually offered transplant. And this, <clears throat> this, this paper, was considered really a landmark because it's changed the entire scenario of liver transplant for alcoholic hepatitis. So what were the arguments against early transplant for patients with alcoholic hepatitis? Because till then, till 2011 and even now, many of the centers in the West and the, uh, also in our country would stick to this six month rule because it was said that it allows the time for liver to recover and many of these patients may not actually need a liver transplant. So you're saving on the organs and you're saving on a, even in India where LDLT is the predominant form, you're saving from a healthy person undergoing a liver, uh, uh, necessary surgery. Then the more important argument that was put forward was that the six month uh, abstinence period allows the patient to demonstrate commitment to abstinence. And it also allows for the implementation of preventive strategies. And this was the most important argument that was put forward for uh, denying the benefit of liver transplant to these patients. And then it was also said that transplanting these patients would give rise to a negative public perception and may bring down the donation rates. That was a fear which was often repeated in many of the meetings and even the publications. Although it has not been proven in the subsequent surveys, Alcoholic hepatitis is a self-inflicted disease. Therefore, the patients are less deserving. This was, again, an argument that has been propagated repeatedly. But again, it has been disproved. And greater relapse rates would lead to greater graft loss rates and thus wastage of the organ. So these are all the arguments that have been put forward over the years for denying liver transplant to patients with severe alcoholic hepatitis. However, what are the arguments which favor early liver transplant? But the most important is the, that up to 70% of these patients will die during six months uh, waiting period. And therefore, you won't have these patients to transplant after six months. So liver transplant actually saved lives. And this was a study from Mount Sinai published in 2016, which actually showed this stark difference in survival, the one year survival in patients who did undergo a liver transplant with this, within the six months period and those who did not and only 11% survived one year in the patients who did not undergo liver transplant. Therefore, it has been said that six month rule is imprecise in predicting relapse and it is discriminatory against patients who might be having a favorable psychosocial profile and may not undergo a relapse to uh, severe drinking or harmful drink. So this was very discriminatory. And then there is no definite scientific basis to this six month rule. Then it is like we have uh, often talked that alcohol is a self-inflicted disease, but this is putting it too, uh, it's too simplistic. Alcohol abuse disorder, we all know, is a, has a complex genetic, psychological and a social background. And it would be just simplifying it too much if they, we say that it's a self-inflicted disease. If we go by that analogy, then even NASH is a self-inflicted disease because obesity, again, you can you have a control of, over your diet so obesity is also a self inflicted disease so that argument also does not hold that alcohol is a self inflicted disease and there are many complex points going on in the background and there's a lot of emerging data to support that the lt leads to good outcomes in patients with severe alcoholic hepatitis and what is this data so it all started about 20 years back. I've not mentioned in this slide, but it was an explant study in 2002, which gave rise to interest about this topic, which showed that there was no difference in the survival of patients who underwent liver transplant for alcoholic liver disease, of which many of these patients actually had evidence of uh, alcoholic hepatitis on explant histology. And subsequently, these there are two well-published studies uh, published in 2007 and 2012 from United States, which showed that explant histology 
there was no difference in patients and graft survival between patients with ald and non ald and those with ash versus bland cirrhosis secondary to elb so that was the first uh, study these are the first studies which gave rise to interest about transplanting these patients and then this was a very interesting survey from france which studied the impact of methurian's publication on the practices of the liver transplant centers and this was a questionnaire which was sent to 18 french liver transplant centers and that clearly showed that before 2011 65% of the centers had never performed an ld for alcoholic hepatitis while after this publication of this study 71% of the uh, centers started doing liver transplant for alcoholic hepatitis although the patient selection criteria were not uniform and the numbers therefore undergoing transplant for alcoholic hepatitis varied widely between these centers and more importantly the application of the 6 month rule declined from 75% to 29% so this paper definitely led to a change in the mindset of most transplant surgeons and the hepatologists and actually this study showed that the hepatologists were more had a more favorable outlook towards transplanting these patients coming to this another popular study from united states which studied the outcomes of early liver transplant for patients with severe alcoholic hepatitis but this was a multi center actually there were 12 centers uh, who were involved in the study 147 patients who had undergone uh, liver transplant for alcoholic hepatitis without observing that 6 months abstinence period were the study subjects and the one and three year patient survival are excellent 94% and 84% similar to those for recipients undergoing transplant for other etiologies uh, an important point that came out of this study was that prior steroid use was associated with early post op uh, uh, post liver transplant mortality and this i had highlighted in the earlier part of my talk also and these were mainly because of the infectious complications in the early post transplant period and when we look at the recidivism rates so the incidence of harmful drinking or sustained alcohol uh, use was 10% and 17% at 1 and 3 years and that has been shown in several other studies that the recidivism rates are usually in the range of around 20% this is just accumulative data from the united states the, the studies i've already talked about these studies in the previous slides and this is just a graph to show how the transplant rates for alcoholic hepatitis have gone up during the last 30 years and so more and more centers are taking up seriously uh, liver transplant for alcoholic hepatitis patients although the caveat is that most of these centers are very choosy about their patients and rightly so because it is the selection of these patients which has made all the difference you cannot just go and transplant every patient with alcoholic hepatitis so how to select the patients actually it's still an evolving field and it reminds one of the early days of liver transplant for hcc in the 1990s when uh, the liver transplant for hcc had started people started transplanting every hcc for but then the results the survival outcomes were very poor the recurrence rates were very high till the milan criteria were published so i think we are still in that stage where the selection criteria for transplant for alcoholic hepatitis are still evolving and maybe couple of years down the line we have some very definite criteria like uh, i couldn't say the milan or the ucsf for hcc so an ideal selection criteria should consist of measurable parameters and then can predict the risk of survival as is recidivism in the patients and whether the patients are resistant to any modification therapy for behavioral therapy so that would be the ideal goal or the goal the currently the selection criteria that are being followed by most of the centers around uh, the world are basically patients with severe al alcoholic hepatitis as predicted by the fdf score or the meld or whatever the center is following no these patients must be non responders or eligible for medical therapies because whatever has been said steroids still have a place in the management uh, algorithm of these patients very importantly favorable psychosocial profile is very important to prevent uh, the patient going back to harmful drinking should have good social support family background and then it has to be a multidisciplinary uh, transplant selection committee consensus before we go ahead with transplanting these patients and patients with recent infection which has been treated or gi bleed should not be excluded because uh, 
time is of great importance and as we have seen that most of these patients are dying within the first month so we cannot wait for these patients to get totally infection free or wait for that period of 6 to 8 weeks after their last bleed because during that time we may actually end up losing these patients what would be the exclusion criteria of course uncontrolled infection untreatable comorbid illnesses who are prognostic profile such as failure to accept addiction as a problem that is lack of insight by the patient and history of previous failed alcohol use disorder treatments the lack of social support is extremely important as an ex exclusion criteria and so is a severe uncontrolled psychiatric disorder so the patient has to take responsibility for his or her illness when we are considering a patient of alcoholic hepatitis for liver transplant this was uh, this is our unpublished data over the last two years this was just an informal study that we did and uh, we surveyed our patients who had been transplanted for alcoholic liver disease and we segregated the patients into those two groups with bland cirrhosis versus ash 15 and 64 and we put arbitrarily our recidivism uh, definition as those consuming more than one drink per standard drink per day so we found that the recidivism was no different between the patients transplanted for bland cirrhosis versus ash and this our results have been substantiated uh, substantiated by uh, actually published studies from various parts of the world so the recidivism rates were different and we need not be overly worried of course i'm not uh, discarding the idea that these patients have to have uh, uh, like a serious assessment by the psychiatrist or the psychologist before we consider them for a liver transplant whether it's an ldl or the dl and although this graph is not truly about transplant for alcoholic hepatitis from our center but we looked at into our patients of aclf recently and about 20 to 22% of the patients in this both the groups were alcoholic hepatitis so i have presented this representative uh, survival curve and clearly shows that the patients who underwent transplant had a much better one month survival compared to those who did not undergo liver transplant and uh, as i said that roughly 20% of the patients in the ccl uh, group were transplanted for uh, severe alcoholic hepatitis so it goes on to show that on those two accounts that is recidivism as well as uh, the survival after transplant we had positive outcomes and therefore we have become more liberal while transplant considering alcoholic hepatitis patients for liver transplant and this i, I think is an emerging trend uh, all around the world so i would say that now it's time that uh, over the last many years the data is getting crystallized the thoughts are getting crystallized and we have to move and we should be moving from controversy to consensus so what are the points on which we have consensus so the consensus is that it's alcohol use disorder is not just an irresponsible behavior problem it has a complex genetic and psychosocial background severe alcoholic hepatitis has very high short term mortality and therefore we have to act fast the prediction models for alcoholic hepatitis whichever we are using are not very accurate even uh, mdf uh, patients who have a score of less than 32 30% of those will also die within one month medical therapy only steroids have been found to be of some benefit and in a small percentage of patients and then the steroids have their own uh, own drawbacks the most important being increased rate of infective complications there is accumulating data which favors early liver transplant and it's been shown that survival after ld for ah is similar to ld for patients with bland alcoholic cirrhosis recidivism rates in most studies are less than or equal to 20% therefore 6 month rule should now be not i won't say it should be discarded but should be applied selectively and because it discriminates against patients who have good psychosocial profile and uh, that is to the tune of around 80% patients who would be unnecessarily denied a life saving procedure and then coming to the topic that was uh, given to me so where to set the bar and being consistent about it so what is the bar the no principle of normal liver transplant should be applied in my opinion high mortality that is high mortality without transplant and patients not too sick to survive a liver transplant so uh, the patients with severe alcoholic hepatitis fit the bill on these two accounts and then it is the responsibility of the treating team that the post transplant care should be tailored 
to optimize the outcomes and in this particular case it has to be proactive management of alcohol dependence and how to improve the consistency it's by making the selection criteria more objective and i'm very positive that it is actually happening so with that i come to the end of my talk thank you for your kind attention Uh, thanks, Shalim. That was that was excellent. Obviously, um, I think it's like you said. It's probably a mindset issue rather than a clinical data issue here. Um, if I may ask you one question, you know, yes, if you please. have a patient with a high madri uh, mm -hmm. in your ICU, at what point would you approach the transplant question, and how long do you wait um, for your medical? management to respond you wait the standard five day seven day response and how do you how do you approach that uh, so that's a very good question because uh, being uh, whenever we have a patient we'll go by the clinical and the social profiles of the patient so one is how sick is the patient whether he's transplantable or not whether he's severely infected or not so main concern is it's the degree of organ failure if he has multiple organs which are failing is deteriorating then we would not be considering transplant and secondly and more importantly i think it is the family if we see that the family is supportive and as you all know that in india especially in the north we only have ld ldlt as the option so if they are coming forward on their own volunteering that we have donors and we want to go ahead with the liver transplant because of, of very often these patients are too sick to be interviewed in a proper setting of a stable psychological background so we would be liberal in transplanting these patients considering that after a clinical assessment we have a fair idea that this patient is likely to make it so if you consider the timing of the medical therapy definitely we, we don't go for uh, use of steroids because we feel that steroids have always resulted in a very high infectious complication rates post transplant so we may be biased against steroids but that has been because most of the patients that we receive are actually in a state where they have already received steroids many of those patients and we have had uh, like negative outcomes after transplant for these patients so per se as a group we are not using uh, the steroid therapy for our patients until unless they are very stable and they are actually these patients the those who are very stable actually do not need steroids so our protocol is to just optimize these patients on the aspects of their organ failure that is if they can be taken off the ventilator if their kidney function can be improved if they can be we don't aim for freeing these patients of infection so we don't wait for them to actually become culture negative because over the years we have realized that you, it is not possible to make these sick patients infection free so our goal is to just prepare the donor see where the patient is moving with our medical management if he is improving then on the first possible date where we think he has been adequately optimized and this is the best optimization that can is possible in this patient we would take this patient for a liver transplant okay thanks shalin i mean i would i would go as far as to suggest that if the family is coming up with a donor that is solid evidence of family support yes you, yes you i totally need, agree you don't need to go for any other assessment Yeah. Uh, any any other questions from uh, perhaps uh, Kaiser or Dr. Koshal or Charles? Yeah, please do. So uh, I think uh, one important, very important issue in these patients is to differentiate between an alcoholic ACLF and a pure alcoholic hepatitis. So if you have a pure alcoholic hepatitis and possibly the first episode of this kind of uh, alcoholic complication i think these are the patients in whom steroids should definitely be tried problem is that we have not been able to filter out patients who have pure fatty uh, pure alcoholic hepatitis versus aclf and many steroid trials possibly would have included aclf patients also or many physicians who have experienced treating these patients with steroids would have treated aclf alcoholic aclf patient with steroids so this is the group of patient which will have bad outcome with steroids but a pure alcoholic hepatitis having a large liver possibly the first episode of hepatitis would do good with steroids that's uh, is my reading although i wouldn't say i treat a lot of patients with steroids yeah so i so, agree with you kushal on that account but i think in the real life scenarios this is a very difficult situation and even the 
guidelines for trials have said that biopsy is not mandatory now for including patients of alcoholic hepatitis in the in the trials but then short of a biopsy it's very difficult to differentiate pure alcoholic hepatitis or the first episode from underlying aclf so it would be it, i think this is easier said than done and myself being a surgeon and uh, therefore the patient profile that i see is most of either patients them i think almost 100% of the patients that i see are with a background of aclf or they have received an a steroid therapy outside before being referred to us so i would say it's a referral bias so i cannot answer on that question with great confidence but yes what you say is i totally agree but at the same time i would like to say that it's very difficult to implement or follow in the real life scenarios yeah so it's a question i think uh, perhaps dr Shal- uh, shalin can answer or dr kaushal can uh, the question is how many of your patients have relapsed with alcohol after transplant i think you did address that in this slide but uh, perhaps that needs a bit of reiterating yeah so i have mentioned that in our small that informal study that we survey that we did actually all of the patients did not answer to our survey but who, those who was ever answered it's basically around 13% that is coming who went back to alcohol and when going back to alcohol we excluded the patients who were occasional drinkers what the cut off was one drink per day so by that criteria roughly 13 to 14% of the patients in both the groups went back to drink yeah that is That's i would call point. harmful drinking sure sure 14 gram is what you put as the cut off yeah that is the by american definition of a standard drink correct some have 10 grams <laughs> of standard drink i guess that's pretty yes subjective. yes i do agree <laughs> <laughs>